Thank you for having me. My name is Keith Stokes. I'm Director of Business and Development for Mayor Jorge Olorosa's Office of the City of Providence. And I'd like to spend a few minutes sharing with you the research and work that went into creating the Matter of Truth Report. The Matter of Truth Report was established by executive order in July 15, 2020 by Mayor Olorosa in an executive order that promoted and advanced a process called Truth, Reconciliation, and Municipal Reparations. This program was established to address the institutional and systematic bias and racism affecting African heritage, indigenous people, and other people of color within the city of Providence. The process which began with truth would set the stage for a significant amount of research, document, and compiling oral histories to clearly understand the history of racialized discrimination that enraptured Providence from the very founding over the next three and a half centuries. The research effort had collected over 650 primary secondary sources of documentation. This was all compiled and produced into a book, which was called the Matter of Truth Report. This report itself would not have been possible if it wasn't for the active support and participation of a number of national, state, and local archives, including the State Black Heritage Society, who led the research effort, State Rhode Island Archives, Rhode Island Historical Society, City Province Archives, and many others. The report itself is separated into seven parts, which documents over a four century history of racialized discrimination. It begins with part one, which establishes the founding enterprises, particularly impacting indigenous people on their land, and then very soon after the use of enslaved African later. And then it travels through the centuries into the present day. In fact, this report provides a comprehensive assessment of racialized discrimination, which begins with the indigenous land taking and the enslavement of African people, but continues well into the 20th century to the present day of racialized discriminations in areas of housing, employment, and basic rights. The first part of the report begins with a very detailed description of the early settlement of Providence. In fact, few people would realize that between the years 1616 and 1619, during the times of the first European settlement contact of the Americas, there was a significant pandemic, not unlike the pandemics that we're facing in the present day. But back in 1616 and 1619, what was called the Great Dying would be possibly the first recorded pandemic in Western Hemisphere. This pandemic, which brought European diseases to the New World, would impact a large percentage of the native populations from coastal Maine to coastal Cape Cod. During that time, scholars have found that nearly two thirds of the indigenous populations who were living along the coastal areas of the Atlantic coast had succumbed to disease in only several years. It's important to recognize this because as Europeans arrived and as they landed, it uh, would clear the way for them to have direct access to land and most importantly, would give them the ability to not only settle, but expand upon the land and use the land for their own purposes. Very soon after in the 17th century, by the middle of the 17th century, as wide swaths of land are available for colonization, for development, uh, and for certainly prosperity, there's a need for labor and particularly free labor. So by the early part of the 17th century, at least by 1650, we now see Africans being brought to Rhode Island for the explicit purpose of being the free labor to work on land. So when we begin to think about the very settlement of early Providence or New England or anywhere within the Western Hemisphere, there are two very basic driving premises, indigenous people land and the use of enslaved African people labor. And it's the enslavement of African people and the disposition and use of native lands that is squarely rooted in the very founding of the city of Providence and across New England and across the Western Hemisphere. The report also goes into detailed information about the very establishment of the early African arrivals. In the report, we've been able to document that between 1705 and 1807, commonly called the golden age of Rhode Island colonial history, there are at least 934 documented slave voyages that tie Rhode Island merchants between West Africa to the West Indies and back to Rhode Island. Out of that 934 voyages, we've tabulated about 150,000 enslaved Africans were brought to the new world as chattel property directly tied 
to Rhode Island merchants and vessels. And then we further broke down this information. We found that during that time frame, Newport was at the very center of not only colonial Rhode Island, but colonial British American slave trade, closely followed by Bristol and Providence. We also have the opportunity to be able to detail not only the slave voyages, but in many cases, the vessel owners, the Africans that were transported, what we now call the Middle Passage from largely West Africa to the West Indies. And then we were able to trace some Africans who would eventually come to Rhode Island shores. We also had the opportunity to work with scholars across the African diaspora, having access to primary and secondary research documentations in places like Curacao, Bahamas, and particularly Jamaica and Barbados that have very significant ties to the transatlantic slave trade and Rhode Island participation. We also had the opportunity to work with scholars and visit Ghana, where many of the Africans who would eventually arrive in Rhode Island have their initial roots. In fact, we find that many of the Africans that would survive the transatlantic slave trade, survive the Mill Passage, and eventually arrive in ports like Providence, Newport and Bristol, many would originate in what is today Ghana. We also begin to understand that as Africans are arriving and indigenous land is being expanded upon, we're also now recognizing in the 19th century that Providence becomes a very early settlement for now free Africans. By the end of the American Revolution, most enslaved Africans in New England particularly are now free. And as they become free, they're now trying to build their lives by owning property, building businesses, worshiping and supporting their families in small neighborhoods and enclaves. In the case of Providence, some of the earliest African heritage enclaves, which include not only free Africans, but indigenous people, all living and working in these enclaves of Providence, which have names such as Squaw Hollow, later Hardscrabble and Snowtown. These areas today would be most characterized within the boundaries of the South Lawn of the State House, the Providence train station and Canal Street. We also know that as these early free African heritage communities are carving out existence as free Africans, not only in Providence, but across the Northeast and New England, we also find that during the early 19th century, during what we call the interbellum era, the years leading up to the Civil War, there are a series of devastating racial riots that deconstruct uh, these communities. In Providence, two very significant race riots take place in the Hardscrabble neighborhood in 1824, then later in the Snowtown neighborhood in 1831. These race riots not only deconstructed homes and took away businesses and opportunities, but it made a very clear symbol that free Africans as landowners, as businessmen, as fellow worshipers were not wanted in urban communities such as Providence. And it's important to understand what was going on in Providence and places like Hardscrabble and Snowtown was simultaneously also going on in Boston, Baltimore, Philadelphia, and across the New England and Northeast landscape where free Africans dared to live and worship freely. Later in the 19th century in the, in the report, we begin to identify a policy that takes root in a number of New England included communities, particularly Providence. It's a policy what was called warning out, meaning that the community at that time was very concerned that there was the poor who the city or the state did not have the resources to support. So decisions were made that if we're going to support the poor, then they have to be poor who are bona fide residents of the community. We will not support people who have immigrated here or recently arrived in our community. These warning out policies were a set of policies where the town councils had under order the ability to bring people before them and determine if they should be a town resident lawfully and receive any public support or benefits or to be determined as unlawful to be in the town and then would be warned out and escorted out of the town. During this time of warning out policies in the records of the actual cases which exist in the Providence City Archives, we see a significant percentage of warning out hearings on people of color, African heritage and indigenous and particularly women. So these warning out policies become yet a formal public policy to restrict and in many cases remove largely women and people of color from in many cases the communities that they had lived in or who were born into. And by 1848, the city of Providence finally formalizes itself with a police department, an incorporated city, 
And this police department specifically is set up to enforce the laws of disorderly inhabitants and those deemed as non-citizens. Also during the 19th century, we begin to see a pattern of further taking of indigenous people land, largely the remaining Narragansett people, but also detribalizing and destabilizing the very tribes and the essence of who they are. By the end of the King Philip's War, by the end of the 17th century, many of the surviving Narragansetts who survived war, survived pandemics, and those who were sold off into slavery were now trying to begin to rebuild their lives in the very land that their ancestors had lived upon for centuries. By the middle of the 19th century, you see municipal and state policies begin to determine who would be a sovereign Narragansett or a tribal indigenous person who should not be. This concept was based upon having full Indian blood. Indian blood would be a concept and play a central role in determining Narragansett and other indigenous people identity. What's extraordinary about this policy is it is the larger white community and its laws that are determining Narragansett sovereignty and Narragansett existence, not from the people themselves. And what we find is a policy that culminates in 1880 with the Rhode Island General Assembly completely detribalizing the Narragansett tribe within Rhode Island based upon the simple statement that the belief was is that there were not full-blooded Narragansetts and indigenous people left in Rhode Island. Many of them were mixed with African heritage people who had Negro blood. This term of Negro blood would be used as a tactic to effectively deny Narragansetts and other tribal members of their legal rights to their ancestral land and native identity. The Narragansett tribe would not reclaim their sovereignty through federal government intervention for 100 years later in 1983. And as we move into the 20th century, the report begins to identify a whole new evolution of racialized discriminatory policies that deconstruct neighborhoods, that restrict the ability for indigenous and African heritage people to live, to work and prosper. In many cases, in neighborhoods and communities that they had lived in for centuries. And we begin to see this culminate during the Great Depressions of the 1930s. By 1934, the National Housing Act is established by Franklin Delano Roosevelt. And this begins a process of establishing a number of instruments to help propel people from poverty and out of the depression and into some level of middle-class prosperity. One of the most important federal policies that is established through the Federal Housing Administration is to later create federal housing authorities. It also creates a very important instrument that would allow for federal insurance of home mortgages, provide low interest loans for home purchasing, and it would literally provide an opportunity to propel many lower income Americans into home ownership. What we know today and we recognize today, one of the fastest paths from low income to moderate income in equity building is owning a home. So during these Federal Housing Administration, the New Deal, Deal era, hundreds and hundreds of thousands of Americans would have access to these federally insured mortgages and support systems and give them access for the first time in their family history of owning their own home. Unfortunately, these federal housing administration policies were not made available to people of color. And in fact, they would set the stage for a highly discriminatory practice that further restricted any loans, mortgages, or financial instruments that were insured with federal dollars to be invested into very specific racialized neighborhoods. This policy called redlining was a process where communities by financial institutions, realtors and other officials, both public and private, would determine certain neighborhoods not worthy of mortgage insurance investment. If your neighborhood happened to be within one of those redlined communities, you would not be eligible for a federal insured mortgage or support. What you see here before you is a 1935 red line map of the city of Providence. And in the city of Providence in 1935, if you happen to live within the Fox Point, South Providence, West Downwood, Lippitt Hill, and large sections of College Hills neighborhood, you are red lined out and would not receive federal mortgage insurance and further support. These communities then, as they are to this very day, had significant percentages of people of color, lower moderate income people, and people who would have best benefited from and had the greatest need for these programs were restricted simply by race, 
and by neighborhood. And this 1935, early 20th century policy of redlining would set the stage for the next level of public intervention in deconstructing communities of color within Providence that would later be called urban renewal. And the urban renewal policies that took root in the 40s and 50s, again, came out of a federal program to remove blight, to begin to reimagine and reinvest in neighborhoods and communities. The challenge with the urban renewal program, which would establish at the state and municipal levels the formations of redevelopment authorities that had powers of not only acquiring land, but had powers to condemn land under eminent domain for the purposes of urban renewal. This very significant federally initiated and state and municipal implemented policy of renewal had direct and negative consequences, largely on historic communities of color. In Providence, urban renewal designated areas included Lippitt Hill, parts of College Hill, Fox Point, Upper South Providence, and the West Elmwood neighborhoods. In 1950, the Slum Clearance Redevelopment Act was passed by the Rhode Island General Assembly, and it gave broad powers to the city of Providence and the newly formed redevelopment agency to walk into those communities, seize properties, take down what they term, the term were blighted properties to intimate domain. What's extraordinary about this action is, is that these neighborhoods, 30 and 20 years before, and their residents could not qualify for federal mortgage insurance, small business insurance and support, all the resources that everyone else would receive to invest in, build upon, and sustain their communities was restricted to these same largely communities of color who could not invest in their communities. And now the federal government is walking in and saying, your communities have not been kept up, your home is not within code, it is blighted, and we will now step in and deconstruct your communities. Possibly one of the most dramatic impacts and most documented impacts of urban renewal policies within a largely community of color is the former Lippitt Hill neighborhood. The former Lippitt Hill neighborhood, which is today bounded by North Main Street, Only Street, Dole Avenue and Camp Street was one of the most historic and one of the oldest African indigenous and later Cape Verdean communities, not only in Providence, but in Rhode Island and New England. The Lippitt Hill community before urban renewal was vibrant. Uh, through the Matter of Truth report, we were able to select collections from around Black Heritage Society. And we documented over 80 Black-owned businesses actively operating in the 1940s and 50s in the Lippitt Hill neighborhood. During the Reconstruction and urban renewal era, nearly 400 families were displaced and several hundred residential properties were completely deconstructed in the Lippitt Hill area, having devastating impacts to the men, women, and children and families who had lived, worked, and worshiped in that neighborhood in many cases for centuries. And just to give you a, a very dramatic example of the deconstruction that went on in that community, this is a 1952 area of the Lippitt Hill community as it existed. On the lower right, you can see what has exists today, Hope High School and its ball field, and the Lippitt Hill community is above it. You can see it's very dense. There's lots of housing, there's lots of activity, it's a vibrant community. This next slide from 1962 demonstrates the complete and utter deconstruction and devastation of Lippitt Hill through urban renewal policies. The entire neighborhood is nearly wiped off the face of the map. What was going on in Lippitt Hill was also going on in West Elmwood, it was going on in South Providence, it was going on in the Roxbury section of Boston, parts of Newport, nearly every urban community where large percentages of people of color, largely African heritage, were living and working and worshiping, were deconstructed in a short period of time through federal, state, and municipal policies and actions. James Baldwin, who was possibly recognized as one of the greatest 20th century authors and critics, would coin urban renewal as actually being Negro removal. And clearly, as we interviewed existing families who could remember the days of their removal and deconstruction, clearly urban renewal policies had the same devastating effects of the racialized riots of the 19th century. So what does this all mean within the report? And what are the next steps? Well, the next steps are Mayor Lawser has now established a municipal reparations commission. The commission is charged of taking the research and data from the Matter of Truth report outreaching and interacting with the community as he's doing, as we're doing today, and really getting as much input from the people on how we should build a reparative justice plan 
to what we see as the greatest negative consequence of racialized discrimination. And that consequence is, is the racial wealth gap that we see today. The very fact that racialized discrimination began by the taking of indigenous people land, it began with the enslavement of African heritage people, but it continued through the centuries through publicly sanctioned policies that restricted African heritage and other people of color to the simple benefits of local, state, and federal programs and services that would allow them to build equity, own a home, own and operate a business, have access to equal housing, to equal employment, to choose the neighborhood where they would like to live. All those things that are basic rights for all Americans was reduced or restricted, and in some cases removed based upon people's neighborhood and by their racial identity. So the Municipal Reparations Commission will start with a $10 million American Rescue Plan Act or OPER plan investment. And that will set the stage for a series of investment programs and support mechanisms that will hopefully attract additional public private financial support, but most importantly, will begin the process of repairing centuries of racialized discrimination that unfortunately today is still evident in many of the same historic communities that have been impacted by 18th and 19th and 20th century discriminatory policies. We look forward to working with you on this endeavor. We need as much public input because there is no single path to reparative justice. It's a path best traveled by many. Thank you for taking the time and listening in. And we look forward to working with you on this very important endeavor going forward. Thank you.